Lord bless you, brethren beloved. Welcome to another Bible study. Uh, we are on the series looking at the church, the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. And especially in today's day, it is important, in fact, it is imperative that as children of the Most High God, we take stock of who we are and understand clearly what we are a part of so that we can be clear in our minds, we can be clear right across the spectrum as to what is expected of us as children of the Most High God, as members of the body of Christ, and so live our lives so that it is pleasing to God and we are walking smack in the will and in the words of Almighty God. It's important because we can easily find ourselves being in the church and yet because of lack of knowledge, we are unaware of what our responsibilities are as men and women of God. And we have to be careful because there are some things that we will never be able to use or have as an excuse the fact that we didn't know. The Bible said through one of the Old Testament prophets, my people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. And so it is important that we strive day by day and week by week and month by month to delve into and get into the Word of God so that we can know what is expected of us as children of God. We can know what our responsibilities are as a part of the body of Jesus Christ and live our lives according to the word of God, according to the expectation of the Lord of glory. And that is very, very important. To this end, we started this series and we went back to the very beginning establish and to show uh, that the church that you and I are a part of today was actually in the mind of Almighty God from way back at the beginning. We therefore started from the tabernacle in the wilderness and went through to show that God has always wanted to dwell among his people and in a very profound, a very marked way, he showed that through his coming to dwell in the tent, in that section of the tent called the Holy of Holies, God came down and dwelt, amen, between the wings of the cherubim on the mercy seat, right there in that place. And that was God conveying to us some things that ultimately was going to happen uh, penultimately in the church age that you and I are in now and ultimately uh, in the final state when all things would have become new and God will be dwelling right in the midst of his people. He will be sitting on the throne and he will be dwelling amongst us forever and forever and forever. And so he started to show that plan that he had in his mind from way back there and that was to be consummated, amen, at the end of the ages. Now, we spend some time going through the tabernacle in the wilderness and I won't rehearse uh, all the things that we have gone through, but we had gone through quite a bit and we took the time to show us the different uh, items that made up the tabernacle, you know, the furniture, the equipment, the, the, some of the material, how it was laid out. And we went through and kind of presented something. But one of the things, brothers and sisters, that we emphasized, one of the points that I really wanted to make as we went through that old tabernacle experience. And remember, we weren't doing a study of the tabernacle because there is so much in that study for us to grasp, for us to learn, and for us to apply. But we were essentially touching on some of the things to the extent that we appreciate 
the need for the tabernacle so that we appreciate the fact that God, when he gave the instructions to build that tabernacle, he gave instructions uh, to Moses and instructed him to follow the pattern that was shown to him on the mountain. And so we saw Moses coming and word by word, in terms of what he received from God, he went and he implemented, he put it in place. He followed the pattern that was given to him. We also saw in the execution of the services in the tabernacle that those priests and high priests and the people themselves that were in the outer court, when they did what they did, they were very meticulous, they were very deliberate, and all of that is important. It shows the earnestness and the seriousness with which they took their function, with which they took their work, uh, being a part of the tabernacle. The tabernacle is what God used as a means of salvation at the time. Uh, the, every time that that animal was offered up and that blood was shed, God would roll back the sins of the people for another year. And so year by year, they had to go through that process. But then even before the annual uh, feat of offering the sacrifice and offering the blood and allowing God to forgive them so that they could carry on one more year, even while that happened only once a year, other things were happening in the tabernacle throughout the year. And every time that there were activities taking place in the tabernacle, the people were serious and the priests were serious and, and, and everything showed a kind of solemnness, a kind of seriousness because it had to do with the work of Almighty God. It had to do with service in the tabernacle. It was the central focus of the children of Israel and everything that they did revolved around it. And so we learned a lot of lessons uh, from just looking at the thing. When they had to offer the sacrifice on the brazen altar, when they had to go and wash at the brazen liver, when they had to prepare themselves to go in through the door into the tent itself. And everything that was done, it was done to a kind, with a kind of precision, a kind of meticulousness, because this is what was required of Almighty God. No jokers were there because their lives depended on following through with some things. When God said, I want uh, the, the, the fire that is inside of the tent to never go out, and it must always come from the fire that was outside, straight from the altar itself, uh, to keep the fire burning on the inside. No strange fire must come. It must only come from one place. God gave that instruction. And we see that the folks meticulously followed the things that were written, the things that were declared from the mouth of God to Moses. And then Moses passed it on to the folks. And everybody did their thing in their order. And that was a lesson to us. We also see where God required and the people themselves lived a separated and holy life. The requirements of the tabernacle experience uh, requ required that they live a certain way. So when we look at the people of God and when we look at how they conducted themselves and when we look at the fact that God asked them to separate themselves from all the other people around them, when the tabernacle was set up, others would be looking on from in different countries around when they were on the wilderness journey. And folks no doubt would wonder about these people. They're strange. They do strange things. They act as if they are the only people on earth, they don't participate in this, or they don't do this, or certain things they avoid, and, 
And that was all a part of what God had required of them to do as a part of their separation process. Mark you, they are human beings. They are a part of the human family. So there are some things that no matter who you are, no matter where they are from, uh, even as children of God, there are some things that we will do being a part of the human family. And so the socialization process and, you know, some things what we do and how we do it and so forth, some things will be common to us as humankind. But then there are other things that God specifically told them not to partake of and to separate themselves from. And if you are going to be my people and if I am going to be your God, this is the kind of walk that I would um, require of you. And we see the children of Israel taking those things very seriously. We get the distinct sense that as they performed their duties, because they were a part of the chosen generation, they were a part of the royal priesthood. And that was something that was honorable to them, you know, at the time. And so they carried out all their work with um, precision and with purpose. Uh, they were deliberate in what they were doing because they understood the God that they serve and that what he requires of them. They ought to do it diligently and with humility and with love and with holiness. And all of this would have been transmitted to us as we took time and look at the performance in the tabernacle. But then we made a very important point, a most important point at some point, at some uh, part of the discussion over the last couple of weeks or months since we have started. There was a, a very important observation and then comment and that was that what was happening back there in the tabernacle prefigured the church of Jesus Christ that was to come in the New Testament era. We see or we saw where some things were happening that as you look at it and because of the vantage point where we are today, we can look at it and see easily that it flows right over into the practices of the church even today. And so we made the point that the tabernacle prefigured the church. And therefore, if we are to be serious, or if we are to understand how serious they took their workings in the tabernacle, because that was the vehicle that God used to bring about salvation then, then we ought to also be very careful how we treat with our position in the church today because it is another vehicle that God is using or that God has used to bring about the salvation of mankind in this New Testament era. And so while there are things that physically differ, I am going to show us because we are going to link it today and we are going to look at the parallels and we are going to recognize that the seriousness and the solemnness and the purposefulness with which those folks operated back in the church then, and pardon me if I say back in the church then, because it might seem as if it was a slip of the tongue, but it really is not. Because even back there in the tabernacle, that was in the wilderness, it was actually a church that was there. And I want us to understand that, right? It wasn't the New Testament church, but it was still the church. And therefore, if you notice, it had its rules, it had its protocols, God was in charge, there were leaders that were there, in the same way how in the New Testament church there are uh, the protocols and there are the doctrines 
uh, God is fully in charge. It is his body. He has his leadership in place. And it all follows the pattern that was established back there. And the fact that God is in charge of the church today, the New Testament church, as he was in charge of the tabernacle back there, I would call it the Old Testament church. It means that what is common in both instances, the church in the wilderness and the church in this New Testament era, what is common, actually common, is the fact that it is the same God that was in charge. He was in charge then, he is in charge now. It means that if we understand who he is, he is the God that changeth not. Yesterday, today, and forever, he is the same. And I want us to catch that principle. He does not change. His holiness does not diminish. His godness is not eliminated with time. It does not decrease with time. You know, some things as time go on, it, it gets lesser and lesser in terms of its intrinsic value. You know, some things as time go on, it wears down. So it is not as strong, it is not as potent as it was at the beginning. You know, the process of um, deterioration would step in. So over time, things are not as they were at the very beginning. But it is not so with Almighty God, dearly beloved. Brethren, beloved, it is not so with Almighty God. As time go on, he remains the same. He does not diminish. He does not get any better. Because he cannot be better than how he is. He is perfect. And you cannot add to perfection. You cannot take away from God. Because as I said, he's perfect. And perfection cannot be diminished as it relates to Almighty God. So he cannot get any better. He cannot get any greater. He cannot get any nicer. He cannot be any more powerful. Because he's at the zenith of perfection in every possible way. And so this God, yesterday, today, forever, he's the same. He changes not. So... His holiness does not diminish. His righteousness is just as powerful. And his requirement for us today, in the church today, is no less than what he required of his people in the church in the wilderness. And pardon me if you hear me keep saying the church in the wilderness, because I had a, a little discussion with um, folks just recently, and they were saying that I was implying as if they... The tabernacle was a representative of the church and they were making the argument that it is two different institutions, two different things and there are no comparisons. But I beg to differ and to submit to us that there is a basis on which to do comparisons. And in fact, what was in the wilderness, just like what is in the New Testament, in the New Covenant today, what was in the wilderness is a church. And I submit that. And I will back it up, not only by making comparisons um, that are real, that are there, but I will use scripture to back it up. And so the basis, the real reason, brethren beloved, on which in starting the study of the church, we went from the tabernacle, from Exodus to build up, is because I wanted to show I wanted us to see, I wanted us to understand that what we are in today must be taken as serious as the people back there took their salvation. For that's what it was under that dispensation, under that period of time. That was what was available to them. And what they had, they took it seriously. I'm, I'm saying, therefore, what we have, we must equally take it seriously because it is the same salvation. It is under, however, a different covenant with different 
approaches, but it is God that has put it together and he requires the same kind of intensity, the same kind of purpose, the same kind of seriousness, and do not lose that fact. Um, we are in a day and age in this church era where leaders have conveyed to their congregation, have conveyed to many folks that thank God we are no, un, no longer under the law. And of course, that is biblical. We are no longer under the law. We are under grace. Not that God wasn't full of grace from back there then and had exercised the grace and mercy. But we are not directed by the things that are written in the law. But we are directed by the spirit of Almighty God and by the hands of Almighty God. And that makes the world of a difference. That is where our freedom is. That is where we know that we are not under the bondage of the letter, but we are under the liberty of the spirit. And that is awesome. But there is a thing that is conveyed to many saints in different places across the world that gives them the impression that what they have no longer requires that grit and seriousness and tenacious attitude that you have to hold on to this thing for their life because you now have freedom. You're free to worship God anyway. And so even if you don't do this or if you do that, God will understand. Well, God has always, brethren beloved, been an understanding God. But that doesn't change the fact that he requires some things from us in terms of how we ought to live. It doesn't mean that he has slackened up on what is his basic nature of being holy. It is a basic attribute of God, the holiness of God. It, it does not diminish. It does not get any less. He does not require less of us. And I want us to understand, so because that is fundamental. It is the reason why when we look around in our world today, we see a sign that says church. But then when we examine what is called church in many places, we are appalled, we are frightened. It doesn't appear to be church. And so we might easily say, leave them, leave everybody, let everybody do their own thing. Because uh, we are in a time when it is no longer the law, but it's grace. And grace frees us to do any and everything as we see fit, as we worship God. And so that has been conveyed and it is pervade all across the world and so folks have this thing and this feel that they can do anything and walk any way and live any way so long as they have faith in God and have confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord because people have made it out that that is all that is required for us to have salvation but brothers brethren beloved I want us to understand that it is more than that. And from the Bible, we must look and we must see and we must appreciate that the Bible did not convey this kind of church, a free-for-all where everything goes. That was never the case in the tabernacle and it is certainly not the case in the church. And I want us to understand that. So many of us have different backgrounds and we have come from different places and we have heard different things and we have seen different things. And so you know, one of the things, as I said, that always comes across is that in this church era, in this New Testament age, in this dispensation, oh my God, the freedom that we get as a result of receiving the Spirit of God is that we can do anything that is wrong. That is a lie. And we are still guided today by the words of Almighty God. We are still under the purview of the living God who is still in charge as he was in the tabernacle, 
who is still holy as he was in the tabernacle, who requires us to be holy as he did require of the people that were in the tabernacle. And we need to understand this. We're going to see that the church is really no different in principle. Actions and activities differ. Things which were there were a shadow of what is, was to come, which is, we are seeing in the church. And whereas the high priest would go once every year and offer the blood of a, a lamb and then wait for God to come down in his glory and forgive their sin, in today's church, we don't have that happening again because Jesus Christ, the great high priest, died once and for all and shed his blood and it brought about salvation so that repeat annual sacrifice is no longer necessary. So these are, this is what I'm saying. A lot of the things that happen there physically doesn't happen physically again, but it has happened, but in a spiritual way. And in this spiritual house, in this spiritual way, there are things that are required of us. And it is in the word. And Moses had to follow the word to the T. The people that were there followed the word as they executed in the tabernacle. And they followed it to the T because they got strict instructions. Make sure that you don't deviate from the pattern that I have given you. And we are going to compare some things. And we are going to see exactly what I'm talking about. So brethren, beloved, I make the point to us right now. I, I, I reaffirm that point. For emphasis, I say it again. We have to take seriously our place and our position in the church of Jesus Christ. It is not a joke thing. It is not a play thing. And I fear many persons, not only here in Jamaica, but all around the globe, I fear many have embraced what has been exposed and what has been pushed out by many that this era is a much more relaxed era. If you notice, they say that in the church age, God don't strike down people as he struck them down back there in the Old Testament. Well, I'm going to take some time and we are going to look at the tabernacle and we are going to look at the church and I pray God that we see and we recognize that he requires sincerity, truth, dedication, seriousness, us holding on tenaciously to what we have, realizing that this most holy faith is a serious thing that was bought with the blood of Jesus. It means that was sacrificed for us and is therefore not to be treated lightly, not to be entered into unadvisedly, not to go through up today, down tomorrow in terms of our basic thought pattern and its relationship to the kingdom of God, we're going to show that we must be as meticulous as the folks in the wilderness that dealt in the tabernacle were met meticulous. We must be as sincere today in the church, in this New Testament era, as they were sincere in the church in the wilderness. And so, again, I believe you might be saying, here, Pastor, go again, talking about the church in the wilderness. There was no church. The church came about when Jesus first mentioned it in St. Matthew chapter 16. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, Peter, but my Father which is in heaven. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell. See there, pastor, the church was therefore not even yet started. Jesus was talking about something that was yet future. And that is true as it relates to the church in the New Testament. It is true. And then we go over to the book of Acts. 
And we see that the church on the day of Pentecost, what happened, and the church came together, and the word was preached, and were preached, and then boom, folks got baptized and got the Holy Ghost and were added to the church. And thereafter, daily they were added, such as should be saved. And that is facts. But I also want to show us facts from the Bible, and then we are going to reconcile them. Because the Bible is never wrong. And line must be upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. And we must understand that principle. But the Bible will never contradict itself. Scriptures must reconcile. And we are going to reconcile them. So I want to take us down a path today so that we can see clearly that what was happening in the church, in the wilderness, the tabernacle, and what is happening in the church today was very similar because what transpired then was a reflection, was a shadow, was a prefiguring of what is happening in the church today. And that is very, very important. And so I'm going to ask us to turn with me in our Bibles to the book of Acts. I want to reinforce the point that I just made. And then I want to say a few more things and then go into some comparisons to make the point, to show us, brethren, is not a little dolly house joke thing we are in when we talk about the church. Some folks take it as a joke. Some folks take this thing very lightly. We do not understand that we are dealing with God. When the apostle Paul, at the time he was Saul, was persecuting the church, after a while when he really got into it, God met him along the road one particular day. And when he called to him, Saul, why persecutest thou me? I want us to realize that Paul didn't even know who Jesus was. Paul at no time did anything to Jesus himself physically. But what Paul was doing was persecuting the church. And we need to understand that this institution is a powerful institution. It is the body of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus was personal when he spoke to Saul and said, Why persecutest thou me? If you trouble the church, you trouble the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the church is his body. And he declared to those that were there at the time, Upon this, this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So the church is a deep thing. It is the body of Christ. You're troubling church. You're troubling Almighty God. You lift up the church. You're lifting up Almighty God. You're treating with the church. It is signaling how we treat God. And we are going to be held to account one of these days, brethren beloved, by virtue of how we live being a part of this New Testament church. And if you think I'm joking, let us look at a few things. So let us start from the book of Acts. And I would have brought up on the screen Acts chapter 7, verse 30. I'm going to start from verse 37. Acts chapter 7. And we're going to put it up on the screen for us very shortly. Acts chapter 7. We will do verses 37 and 38. And then... We're going to pick up from about verse 44, just to read a few more, because I want to give us a kind of context as to what was happening. But the point that I am making is, beloved, it is important for us to not miss the focus point in all of this, that the seriousness with which we must treat with the church today Learn it from what happened and what we see happening in the church in the wilderness. 
Very important. And so, let us read together. Acts chapter 7, we start at verse 37. Uh, this is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. Verse 38. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. And so, verse 44, we're going to go down. Notice though, before we look at verse 44, notice at the top of verse 38 again. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the mount. Brethren, it's a tabernacle was there, that was there. But we are seeing something here in the New Testament. <coughs> Sorry. That literally speaks about that tabernacle that was in the wilderness as the church in the wilderness. What am I saying? Where am I going? We'll get to it very shortly. Just to provide a little more background, um, let's just read a little bit further. Our fathers had the tabernacle of weakness in the wilderness. So here again, the same thing is being described. In verse 38, it was the church in the wilderness. And to make it clear, in verse 44, they refer to that same church as the tabernacle. So the tabernacle virgin is the church. There was a church back there, but we will break it down in a little while. Our fathers had the tabernacle of the witness in the wilderness as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. Which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of the people. Uh, verse 46, who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. And we could read on. We could read on, you know, Solomon built him a house and we, we have gone through all of that already. I just read these scriptures to give us a background, uh, beloved, so that we can understand um, that what we are talking about essentially is that with all the background, all of what we had gone through since we started up until this point, the brazen altar at the front, the brazen lever being the next piece, and then you go into the tent itself, and then inside you're seeing the table of shoe bread, and then the candlesticks, and then the altar of incense, and then beyond that and beyond the veil, the Ark of the Covenant, which in that place, which is called the, the Holy of Holies, all of that, all that build up all that makeup, everything that was there represented the process that was required in the church in the wilderness. A church was there. The Bible said so. But then, the New Testament speaks of the church which began Jesus spoke about it, as I said earlier, in Matthew 16. Then in Acts chapter 2, we know what happened. And on the day of Pentecost, they were gathered in one accord in one place. And there was a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared upon, unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And we know all that happened. And therefore, the birthday of the church, 
the New Testament church was right there in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, somewhere around AD 33, right there in Jerusalem. So what we are seeing is that in as much as we started out and we said it was the tabernacle in the wilderness, which in fact and indeed it was, we are seeing from Bible, Acts chapter 7 and verse 38, making reference to the same tabernacle in the wilderness, and it was called the church in the wilderness. Why? How? Explain. And equally in the New Testament, what happened in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost was the fulfillment, the coming to pass, the establishment of the very thing that Jesus spoke about in St. Matthew chapter 16, when he said, upon this rock, I will build, future, my church. So it was not yet built, but it happened on the day of Pentecost. So here the church is on the day of Pentecost, but yet still Acts 7 and verse 38 says the church in the wilderness. How is that? And so having said this, I want to introduce us to the word church and what it really means. And therefore, there, to prove that there was, in fact, a church in the wilderness in the same way that there was the New Testament church. And as we go through, we are going to put it together that the church, New Testament or Old Testament, required of us and requires of us to live in a particular way. To know who we are. To understand whose we are. And therefore to manage ourselves. All manner of conversation. In other words, way of life. How we walk with him. How we treat his business. How we treat his word. How we conform to the things that he has given in his book. How we embrace his instructions, how we put it to one side, how we impose ourselves into his thing. Some of us have the impression that we are shareholders in the church. But Jesus said it is his church. We are members, not owners. And although we are hearers and joint hearers, it is in relation to the promises and all the things that is to come to us. But the church as a vehicle is his body, the body of Christ. It is his church, not Brother Daly Church, not Brother Grizzle Church, not Brother Stuart Church, not your church. It is the church of God. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so let us just look at the meaning of the term church. And I just want to establish that. And then we are going to be looking at a few slides as we delve a little bit deeper and learn to appreciate some things very, very important. So let's look at the screen and understand that the church is literally a body of called out believers. I want us to understand saints of God that when we talk about the church, when we talk about the church, we are talking about a body of believers that God has called out. Now, the Greek word for church, brethren, is ecclesia. It is a Greek word and it essentially means a called out assembly. And so, when in St. Matthew chapter 16, G, which we mentioned just a while ago, Jesus was talking about the church. The word that was used there was the Greek word ecclesia. And as I said, and as we're seeing there, it means a called out assembly, a body of believers. Some folks even extend it a little bit deeper and call it a body of baptized believers, a called out group. 
but it is used only in conjunction to a group called out by God. We see, we see this clearly, and this is why it can be applied back to the Old Testament, because back there in the tabernacle, it was the children of Israel that were once held captive in Egypt that God called out of Egypt and put them on the journey to the promised land and allowed them to go through the wilderness, through that wilderness experience. It is those people that he called out of, Israel, of Egypt. Them it was that he also uh, called or considered called out people, a called out assembly, and therefore the word church was applied to them. So ecclesia, which is where we get the word church from, literally means a called out assembly, a body, a called out body of believers. And it can be applied to any group that God called out for the purpose of walking with him towards a particular end. And so it was in order for God, quite in order for God to walk, to call the children of Israel back there, his church in the wilderness. Why? Because we all know the episode very well. They were in bondage in Egypt for a couple hundred years. And we know exactly what was happening to them. Brethren, I know how they were mistreated and, yes, ill-treated. And they cried out, and God heard their cry. And he sent a savior, which was Moses. And Moses, under God, uh, through a process, delivered them out of Egypt and geared them for the journey to the promised land. So they're exiting Egypt. They're leaving Egyptian captivity. The term called out refers to them being called out of Egypt and being set on their way to go to the land of promise, to Canaan's happy land. And so we can easily see that they were a called out people and therefore could easily be classified as the church. And as I said, this is not made up because the Bible in Acts chapter 7 literally called them the church in the wilderness. And so they were called a church because they were called out. They were believers now in Almighty God. He called them out. And notice what is happening now because we're going to look at some parallels because this is what's going to rivet it in our minds. This is what is going to have us to synchronize Old Testament and New Testament experiences and see that we are dealing with something here that is not far apart at all. It is almost a continuation of the same, except that one is not under law but under grace, except that one is not carrying out the sacrifices of the old animals, but the sacrifice of the lamb, the true lamb of God, was accomplished in the New Testament. But the, the, the vehicle is practically, brethren, beloved, the same things. And so I want us to take key notice of the parallels that we are going to draw right here and now. And it is important. So let us look at the... Old Testament scenarios, and we're going to look similarly at the New Testament scenarios and see if we can pretty much put the parallels together. And I want us to take note. Notice that in the Old Testament, and everything that we are talking about here now, brethren beloved, is in relation to the tabernacle to the experience from bondage, from Egypt, from the world, being called out of that, and then being placed on a journey through a wilderness until we get to the promised land. I want us to see that there is a, 
accord. There is a striking parallel and it is signaling, it is speaking loudly if we would but just tune our ears to the spiritual frequency and, and, and pull from this. I don't want any of us to have ears but cannot hear. I don't want any of us to have eyes but cannot see. I want us, brethren beloved, to be the very discerning. Look at what we're saying. See what is happening and just be discerning so that we can know that the same God is in the old and the new. The same God is in the tabernacle and in the church. The same God was in the experiences in both the Old Testament wilderness and in our New Testament wilderness. It is a similar experience. And it is important that we catch the parallels. So, in the Old Testament, they were called out of Egypt. And we know that scenario very well. But can I tell you, Saint Virgin Beloved, that in the New Testament, we that are in the church today, we were called out of the world and called out by Almighty God. We know also that Egypt is a type of the world. And so those Old Testament scenes, for all practical purposes, they were called out of the world. It's just that physically, they were in the land of Egypt, which represents sin and represents the world, and God called them out of Egypt. Where we are today, God called us out of the world system. Some people call it Egypt still. Some people call the world system Babylon. But whatever it is, that is the name that we coin for it. It is the world system. And God called us out, those that are in the New Testament church, out of the world and have brought us into his marvelous light. So notice, in the tabernacle and in the church, we were called out. Now, the next point, notice that the wilderness experience is common to both. When they came out of Egypt, they were promised the promised land. Yes, they were told that they were going to go to a place that had milk and honey and they were going to be blessed and they were going to be tremendously blessed. And knowing the one who made the promise, it had to come to pass. It had to happen. But some folks then might not have realized that before they entered into the promised land, they would have had to go through a wilderness. And folks, I might, say, might easily say, and probably to an extent, it might have been so, but that is not the real reason. But the children of Israel were made allowed by God. It was organized by God for them to go through the wilderness. Because if they were to go into the promised land, they had to know what God brought them through. They had to experience the God of heaven working on their behalf. They had to see God at work in their lives so that they would appreciate and understand. And therefore, when they went into the promised land, they would have had a basis to rejoice and to give thanks to Almighty God. So God allowed them to go through the wilderness experience before they got to the promised land. But I want us to look at the New Testament church that you and I are a part of and realize that when God called us out of the world and brought us into this body, some folks came in with the expectation that it was going to be a bed of roses. Some folks came in with the expectation that it was going to be smooth sailing because they have shunted the world and they have now taken up Almighty God. But I want us to understand for every single child of God, we have a wilderness experience or we have wilderness experiences right throughout our Christian walk. It is the same thing that we are experiencing that they experienced then, except that back there, they were going through a physical plain, a place a desert land grown with sandals on their feet and they were physically walking. But brethren, beloved, we are going through a wilderness experience today. But it is not that we are walking through a desert place in terms of a physical place with sandals on our feet. Just our walk with God. 
where we are at work, where we are at school, where we are at home, wherever. We are experiencing wildernesses in all the places that we trod. Because this is where God has set up for us to see his goodness at work in our lives. So the same call out of Egypt for the Old Testament saints, the same wilderness experience that they had and physically endured, we in this New Testament age have been called out of the world and equally we have a wilderness experience or wilderness experiences. Brethren, beloved, look, it is the same thing. And so the church in the, in the, in the, in the wilderness and the church of the New Testament, different vehicles, but the principles are the same. And as we see this going down the line, we are going to extract towards the end the fundamental truths that I want to bring out before we go further into looking at other things relating to the church. <coughs> Excuse me. And so, we see that in the Old Testament, as in the New, there is a way to approach God. Look at it. Make the comparisons. There is a way to approach God. God. We would have recalled from our going through, and that's why we took the time out earlier in the, 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 the studies to just go through the entire process. Because as we go through the entire process and we look at the brazen altar and we look at the brazen laver and we look at it just to give us that feel for all the things. But I want us to understand, brethren beloved, that all that we were looking at and the part that we wanted to extract for this particular lesson and this particular context is the fact that God had set out a particular pattern for them to follow in their approach to him. Yes, he had. And folks will agree from, it doesn't matter where you're from within the circles of the church, folks everywhere agree that yes, in the Old Testament time, God did speak to Moses and God did show him a particular pattern and yes, God did tell him that they should follow the pattern, yes, go by way of the the brazen altar, you have to offer the sacrifice first because the blood had to be shed. And if you, if you bypass that, you are in trouble. And of course, notice also that then there is the brazen labor. And Moses did not put these things together based on how he felt. Moses did not put these things together because they, they fell into a particular um, constellation and, and the pattern didn't look good and the furniture has you know blended because there was a big one here and then a smaller one after it and then it no Moses did not put it together because you had the brazen first then the brazen then you start to get to the goal after and so I put the lesser the more inferior material first and then the, the greater in terms of value I put last no, that was not Moses' prerogative Moses only put it in the order that we saw because this was the pattern that God gave him. And everybody, in, even in the church today, agrees that that was so. But then you say, but Pastor Daly, fine, that was in the Old Testament. God required that. But it's so different in the New Testament. God has given us a lot of flexibility. God has given us a, a, a whole lot more. He was rigid with them in the Old Testament, but he is not rigid with us in the New Testament. Brethren, beloved, God is God. God knows why he puts some things in place. And whereas we cannot understand one thing we know, is that God Almighty does not do things just by whims and fancy. Just look at how we operated 
in the tabernacle. And then he told Moses, make sure you do it. Oh, I tell you to do it, you know. Make sure of the order that you put it in. Because there is something behind the order. And so if we notice in the Old Testament that God said, put first, as you came through the main gate, out in the yard, in the outer court, as you came through the main gate, you know, the first thing that you would have met upon is the altar of incense, sorry, the brazen altar. Then the next thing you would have met upon is the brazen laver. And then as you go inside of the tent itself, you start to, to meet upon on other things. And, you know, the, brazen, the altar of incense would have been right in front of you. And God has the order all set up. It is the same way or when we come to the New Testament church, we see a certain order. And the order is not necessarily in terms of sequence. Remember, I told us that um, a lot of the things happening in the Old Testament were physical. God took them out of a physical country, Egypt. But for the saints in the New Testament church, it's not a physical country called the world. The world is just a place right around, a system. And God has taken us out. So whereas back there, there were physical things. In the New Testament era, in the New Testament church, is they are spiritual things. So it might not follow a precise order, but the things that are required are necessary. And so we see the brazen altar, and yet in the New Testament we see it speaking about repentance. Because at the brazen altar we know, that's where you make the sacrifice of your, your, your animal, and that speaks to repentance. Repentance. The brazen laver was filled with water and the priest or the high priest had to wash. And if he didn't wash, the Bible said he would die. Similarly, we see in the New Testament a call to wash, but not at a brazen laver, but at the baptismal pool. And then you know, we look and we see the altar of incense straight ahead. And similarly, uh, in the New Testament, we see having repented and been baptized, we go straight ahead and receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost that takes us right into the presence of Almighty God. I want us to understand that these are things that are just there for us to, to, to see and appreciate and, and apply. Very, very important. I want us to also notice, because we know that when Jesus Christ died, Right? He died on a cross. When we look at the tabernacle in the wilderness, when we look at the church in the wilderness, and we examine the layout, right? When we examine the layout of that, uh, those furniture in that place, we see that there is the altar, then the laver, then the altar of incense, and then it goes right up to the Holy of Holies. It follows a straight line. But then when we look, look to your left. So we start at the bottom, that's the brazen altar. Then as you pass the brazen altar, you go next to the brazen laver. Good. Then as you pass the brazen laver, you go up next to the, what is called the altar of incense. Wonderful. And then when we move from the altar of incense and we go further up, we go into the Holy of Holies and we see the Ark of the Covenant right up at the top there. Look at that. Now, if we come back down a little bit, if we look to the left of the altar of incense, we see the candlesticks across to the left. And then if we look to the right of the altar of incense, we see the table of shoe bread right there. Good. So that when we look at the pattern, brothers and sisters, that is set out, we are seeing a picture of the cross. This is actually without even having to stretch our imagination or having to stretch the word of God. This is saying something to us by just the imagery that is presented here. This 
is the imagery of the cross. And nobody knew anything about a cross at that time in history. But God Almighty knew. And he knew that it was upon the cross that Messiah was going to die and was going to bring all of those things that were shadows into reality. So the church of the Old Testament had embodied in it the church of the New Testament, even though it was not yet here. And we see it being reflected in the imagery of the cross. Brothers and sisters, brethren, beloved, we are intertwined. We are together with this thing. And I want us to appreciate and to understand that. So again, we are making the point that, look, this church that we are a part of today in the New Testament is not just a vehicle that just came out of nowhere and we can get up and do as we want. We need to understand that we need to understand that we are intertwined and what we are in today was already in the mind of God and in the plan of God already mixed up and intertwined with the church in the wilderness. So the way that we treat with the church today make sure that it is a reflection of the way that the people back then treated with the tabernacle, the way with which they did the tabernacle services. Brothers and sisters, that is a very important point. That is crucial. That is fundamental. It is not a joke thing. It is not a play thing. It is not to be taken lightly. It is extremely important. Now, if we notice that there were consequences, there were consequences both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament if certain things that God had put in his plan, in his plan were not adhered to. There were consequences. Now, in Exodus chapter 30 and verse 21, we easily see that there is a consequence if the priests bypass one of the things that God had in the order based on his pattern. So Exodus 30 and verse 21 says, So they shall wash their hands and their feet that they die not. And it shall be a statue forever to them, even to him and to his seed throughout their generation. So they must wash their hands and their feet that they die not. Now Mark 16 and verse 16, I think that's the scripture, plus St. John chapter 3 and verse 5. These are scriptures that tells us, gives us consequences also in the New Testament. In the New Testament. Look at what Mark says. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Right? Again, we are seeing consequences, and we need to, we need to understand. So, John 3, verse 5, you can read it when you get the chance, or just read all of that little section there. It was showing that except you be born of water and of the Spirit, you will not enter the kingdom of God. Consequences. I want us to understand, virtue of love. And I just pull one here from each so that we can understand that when God gives the pattern, that when God sets the, the, the bar, we need to be careful how we just get up and believe that we have freedom to the extent that we can put aside God's word because somebody said, a or B or C, be very careful. I want to make that point and I want to emphasize that point and I want to re-emphasize that point. 
if we are uncertain, take the time, get into the word, dig into the word. We have too many persons online over the world teaching all kind of things to the extent that it has watered down this salvation that we have, that folks believe that nothing is required to get into God's presence. But I stand tonight and I want us to understand that that is a lie and it must be mashed down and we better get serious with walking with God or else, or else. And so it is very, very, very important, very serious. Very serious. I cannot overemphasize the seriousness of it. And what we are going through is making this point clearer. Talking about that, because one of the things, one of the things that we always use in trying to make the point, make the strong point that God is somehow a God of love, which he is, a God of grace, which he is, a God that is long-suffering, which he is, we tend to go back to the Old Testament scriptures, brothers and sisters, and somehow fool ourselves into believing that the God of the Old Testament is a kind of God of wrath and judgment. Judgment, just whatever you do. As you do something, judgment pour out and you're utterly, you're utterly destroyed and all of that. I, I mean, we see the seriousness of God there in the Old Testament. But mark you, we also see the grace and the love and the long-suffering of God there in the Old Testament. We fool ourselves, however, and believe that when we come to the New Testament, the God which is full of wrath in the Old Testament is no longer there. And the striking down and those things that we see happening in the Old Testament will never happen in the New Testament, certainly not in the church era. And so the, the, the church era and the New Testament church kind of shows a different side of God where he's long-suffering, and, and, and it does. But what happens, folks lull us in a sense of false security to believe that in the New Testament church, God is always going to be quiet and God is going to just, uh, you know, whatever we do, he's going to cover our sins. And God has been doing that from in Old Testament times, and he continues to do it. And yes, this is a dispensation of grace, but it didn't mean that God didn't exercise grace in the Old Testament, even though they were under the law. Yes, he did. And he showed himself to be merciful. And he showed himself to be patient. One time Abraham came to talk to him and said, God, if I find X amount of righteous people and present to you, don't destroy the place. And God said, all right, I won't find them. And when he couldn't find them, he increased the number, he increased the number. And God was just so patient. God was just so patient. This is how God is, whether old or new. He's long-suffering. He's patient. He's kind. So don't believe that because you see the rough part of God in the Old Testament. You also see his good part, but we are in a delusion and believe that there is no kindness of God in the Old Testament and there is no fierceness of God in the New Testament. Mash that down. We're in Bible study. See the scriptures and embrace the scriptures. God is God. And he's God in the Old Testament and he's God in the New Testament. Yes? I remember when Jonah was to go to Nineveh and God said to him, look here, Carry the words, 40 days, yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be destroyed. And when the people repent, even Jonah vex because God is so merciful and forgiving. Brethren, that was Old Testament time. That's grace. That's long-suffering. That's mercy. And so we have to be very very careful that we don't mismatch 
that we don't delude ourselves and believe that in this era of the New Testament church, the merciful God is not also a fierce God. Because in the New Testament, the Bible tells us that God is a consuming fire and we need to understand. Now let us get back to the slides because I want us to look to see how God acted in the Old Testament when in the church that was there, they breached some fundamental principle. I want us to look at what God did and it is important that we see that, right? I want us to look also in the New Testament of how God acted when a similar thing occurred and they breached some basic principle that God exposed and that they would have known about and they just see how God treated it with it. So Leviticus chapter number 10, verses 1 to 2. Leviticus chapter number 10, verses 1 to 2. And I just want us to take a quick read. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not to. Now I want us to know that God had instructed them where they were supposed to get that fire. So they knew where they should have gone. They knew where they should have picked up that fire and then placed it inside of the holy place. But no, they, for whatever reason, they might have been doing some other things uh, what they probably should not even have been doing. They ran out of time and they just didn't get the thing together properly. They were not diligent. They were not functioning as they should as children of God. And so when it was time for them to get at the place of, of what you would call giving to the Lord, amen, in terms of their work and in terms of their ministry, they just ran in anyhow. And the fire inside of that place might have been going down. And in the interest of time, they just ran and catch up some coal from somewhere and run over to the house of the Lord and offer that fire. God already given instruction. I'm telling us that when it comes to the word of God, he is very serious. He, he will exercise patience many times. But who knows when he is going to act. And the Bible said, in verse 2 now, so they went and they got strange fire. In other words, fire from some other source. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them and they died before the Lord. So they did something contrary to what was required of them. They knew what was to be done. They actually used to do it. They were in service in ministry, in the tabernacle, in the wilderness, in the church, in the wilderness. But for whatever reason, they went, they got fire from some other source, and they came and they offered it before God. Acts 5. And they offered it before God. And lo and behold, God smote both of them dead. Boom. They were in it together. They got struck down together. Let us look in the New Testament church. This is the New Testament, not just the New Testament like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but this is New Testament in Acts when the church was born and when people were saved in the church. And these two that we are seeing here in Acts chapter 5 and verse 1 starting, they are church people. These are people that were in the church. They knew what was required and they literally came into the church and were part of the body. And the Bible said, but a certain man named Ananias, and we won't read all of it. Let's just get back to the, to the slide itself, and let me just give us a quick explanation. But Ananias and Sapphira did something. When they did it, they were being deceptive for they sell a parcel of land. And at the time, you know, everybody was selling what they had and, you know, giving to the, laying it at the apostles' feet. They, who might have come before them, gave, told, you know, I have sold this and I have brought all. I mean, if somebody did sell it and came with half and said, I came with half, it would have been accepted because half is probably what they could give, the best they could give. But Ananias and Sapphira came with deception. They sold what they had 
and they kept back part and came and told God that I am giving you all. It was a lie. They lied to the Holy Ghost. They deceived the apostles. And I'm telling us that we have to be very careful. This was in the church. And the Bible said God smote them dead. Notice that it is Nadab and Abihu, two brothers, family. In the case of Acts, it is husband and wife, family. Whether you are by yourself or by your family, you better be careful, brothers and sisters. We all must be careful how we treat the business of God and how we treat the work of God and how we disparagingly speak about the word of God. This is the word of God. This is God's business and he will act. There are consequences in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. There are instances of God striking down people for breach of his word in the Old Testament. And there are instances in the New Testament. And I am saying to one and I am saying to all, let us understand the church in the Old Testament, the church in the New Testament, the principles and the experiences are the same. Do not be lulled into a false sense of security that you have it all and this is what is here in the New Testament church because this is what people have called around and branded around and they're preaching everywhere. Oh, you don't have to do this. You don't have to worry about that. You don't have to kill yourself about that. Anything goes. This is the New Testament. This is the church age. Thank God. We don't have to worry about the law anymore. Of course, we don't have to worry about the law. But the law said, thou shalt not kill. What, what, so in the New Testament church, because we don't have to worry about the law, we can go kill. Because we're not under law. We can go steal. Because we're not under law. We can go commit adultery. Because we're not under law. That is a lie. No, we need to understand. So we, in some other studies and probably, probably later on, later down, we will look at the whole business of the law and of grace so that we can be clear in our minds so that we are not deluded and we are not fooled and, and led falsely to believe that, oh, it is all right, all right. Or, ah, free, free, free. I am free. Free to do what? We are free because Jesus detached us from the clutches of sin. And we need to understand what that means. Right? The Old Testament, they were journeying to the promised land. Right? We won't go into those scriptures, but it is there for us. Make note of it. If you can't even find it tonight, you can always go back to it. But I want us to, re to, to go back through these scriptures, see them, and understand the principle. They were sent on a journey in the Old Testament church. In the tabernacle in the wilderness, the church in the wilderness, they were sent on a journey to the promised land. And the scriptures are there. The same thing happened in the New Testament. We are on a journey to the promised land. There was a physical place. Our promised land right now is, is in heaven until the heavens come down onto the earth. And we are in the, the sweet by and by in our final state. But we are all on a journey back there. And right here now, and the scriptures are there, Exodus 3, 17, Deuteronomy 26, 9. Read them over in the New Testament, St. John 14, verse 3, Revelation 21, 2 to 4. Read them, saints beloved. Now I want to, to cut this part of our study with the last call, the last point. And it is showing that with all that we have looked at, there is also a call to holiness. Yes, Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 26. Time is on us, so we can't even get into these scriptures, but I'm begging us, please, um, look through these and go through them timely. And in the New Testament, there is a call to holiness by God to the saints. We must live holy. If we look at both of those scriptures, and later on, when you get the chance, and tomorrow, and whenever you start going through, you're going to see that God is saying, Be ye holy, for I am holy. He makes that call to holiness to the saints that were at the church in the wilderness. And brethren, beloved, he made the same call to us who are in the church in the New Testament. Be holy, be holy. For I, the Lord your God, am holy. And so we need to understand, see the parallels. 
and understand that it's not two different things. One literally comes out of the bowl of the other. One was a type. We are now in the reality. One prefigured the other. And when we look and we see the imagery of the cross way back there at the church in the wilderness, we realize that th these things are intertwined. We are together. And the call to holiness is the same call because it is the same God. And His holiness, as I said earlier, does not diminish those that believe that is a different standard of holiness today than it was back there are sadly mistaken. And I say that with all sincerity. Sadly mistaken. Look, let me make this point. Everyone in the camp of Israel was connected to the tabernacle. Everyone in the, there was connected to the tabernacle. Very important. And the head of every house, you know, a group will play the role that they had to play to ensure that as the sacrifice was offered and that they carried it to the, 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 the tabernacle and they went to meet the priests in the outer court and they did what, what they had to do. But that tabernacle was at the center of everything. Uh, probably weeks ago we made mention of that. And you would have seen that tent set up and the gates and everything all around. And when it was placed down, all the children of Israel camped around it. So it was at the center of all that they did. And everybody was somehow connected to that church one way or the other. Nobody could say that, oh, I'm a part of Israel, but I don't, I'm not interested in what is happening in the tabernacle. They had to be interested. They had to be involved. They had to be a part of it. If, if you're, you cannot be a part, that nobody could say that they were a part of Israel and they were not a part of all that was to be done, to be connected to the tabernacle. Otherwise, you would have been considered an outsider and you would have been thrown, what they call, outside of the camp. You would have been killed. You're either in the camp or you're out of the camp. And so everybody was connected to the camp. It was one camp, which was the nation of Israel. Yes, one camp, one group, one tabernacle, and one common connection to God through the tabernacle. And that is very significant. So God was in charge. He was right there in their midst. And everybody was connected to God. Nobody could say, boy, I, I don't you know, like... Even when they said they didn't like Moses and they didn't like what was, you know, Moses was this and Moses was that and all kind of thing. If they wanted to remain in the camp, they had to adhere to what was required in terms of the pattern that God gave. God gave. They had to go to offer their animals with the priests. They had to go through the process. They had to do everything. And anything less would have rendered them outside of the camp. Now, that is very important. That is very significant. And the camp was right at the center of all that they do. It is the same thing, brethren beloved, with the church of Jesus Christ. It is the same thing that we must understand. The church must be at the center of what we do. And all of us are connected to Jesus Christ through the church. Yes, because the church is his body. And he said, and we look at it later on, and I know time is up, coming upon us, so we are going as fast as we can. But we are connected to the head through the body. And we are members, and every member has different things to do. But nobody can pull themselves out and say, I am not into this, and I am not into that. Or anything of the sort like that. If you do, you are rendering yourselves as being no longer a part of the body. And if you are not a part of the body, you are not a part of the church. In the Old Testament, you have to be connected to the tabernacle through the instruments that were implemented by God. 
in the church, you are connected to God Almighty, to Jesus, who is the head by way of the body. And the body of Christ is the church. And we have got to understand that. And so we are all in this thing together. Yes, very important. Notice that when the death angel was going to pass over the land of Egypt, God told, you know, everybody, because they were all a part of the camp. So all that could have happened is that everybody could just run in them house, lock them door. God knows where Israel was. So all he had to do is just pass over and leave Israel and kill the firstborn of the people of Egypt. But that didn't happen. Every house, every house had a responsibility. The head, the leader of every house had to go get an animal, slay the animal, take the blood. They all had a responsibility. Even though they were a part of the body, the different members had to do things to make sure that they remained in the body. That when the death angel passed over, they were safe. And so the households had to get the leader for each of the houses. And they had to get blood and sprinkle and the lintel and the doorpost. And there any house that did not have blood sprinkled over it. Dear any household who feel that they never like what this and they never like that, I'm not going to put nothing there. I already in the camp, but I'm not even going to take no instructions from them. Anybody that did that, the death angel would have passed over. We all have a responsibility. We are connected to the center by being a part of the body. And we better understand it. It was the same thing in the Old Testament. It's the same thing in the New Testament. And the scriptures are here for that. The scriptures are here for that. So I want us to understand. And I want us to be very keen. And to be very careful. And to know that we are a part of the body. For as the 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12 and you can just make note of this. Yes, I'm just going through quickly. For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Let me tell you, saints of the Most High God, the body of Jesus Christ, that's who or what the church is. This church is the body of Christ and the body is one. In other words, it is one church. And nobody can pull themselves out and, as a member. Because you have many members. Yes, Some can do this. Some can do that. Some can act on this. Some can act on that. Dear anybody drag themselves out and say, I am not a part of this. Huh? Well, let us look at the natural body. Because you know that in practice, that cannot happen. If you dismember yourself, you cannot survive. Because you would not have any sustenance from the head or the rest of the body. The heart pumps the blood and the blood goes around and the blood carries the nourishment and the nourishment gets to every member. If you are out of that ecosystem, you will starve to death. You will starve to death. And so it is very important that we grasp that position. Yes, the scripture is very clear. Very clear. We must be careful not to change the pattern. In the Old Testament, they were together. Even if they felt a way about this and that. And we see how God treats with those who felt a way and decided to pull away from the body. We must be very careful. So be very careful. We must be careful not to change the pattern. Exodus 25 verse 40. Although each of us have been given our individual places and ministries, we cannot act separately from the body and survive. That, I, I pulled this from the um, In My Father's House Discipleship Course. It's a very potent point. And I really have to relate it. We cannot act separately from the body and survive. 
And so it is very important. This same application can be made in regards to a local assembly. Yes? And I want us to know that. Very important that we understand that. Now, let me just quickly make this point before I move to close off. Let me make this point quickly. In order to fully understand our place, brothers and sisters, in the plan of God, it is important that we understand uh, the differences between church, singular, and churches, plural. Right? I want us to understand that. According to the scriptures, our Lord only used the term church twice. Jesus only make reference to church, C-H-U-R-C-H, the individual, church, singular, two times. He made refer reference to it in St. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, and we alluded to it earlier on. And he also made reference to it in St. Matthew chapter 18, verses um, 15 to 17. In St. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, he said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. And this is important that we understand that what that scripture is saying. This is talking about the church universal. Jesus Christ is building a church. It is one church. So whether the church in Jamaica is at a location and the church in the U.S. is at a different location, that is quite fine. Wherever across the globe the church is, when it comes to Jesus Christ and he speaks upon this rock, I will build my church, he's talking about all the different places coming together. He's talking about one body, one church, the universal church, the church triumphant. That is what is being referred to here in um, St. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. The universal church, the church triumphant. No matter where you are, once you're connected to the body and you're baptized in Jesus' name and you're filled with the Spirit and you're walking in holiness, yes, and living the word, you are a part of the church universal. I will build my church. Now, in St. Matthew chapter 18, 15 to 17, the concept is a little bit different, and it is talking about the local church. Um, if we turn to that scripture, St. Matthew, just quickly, chapter 18, verses 15 to 17, we, we see a different thing here. Look what it is saying. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him and his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, if he shall hear thee, right? Verse 15, back to 15, I want us to, if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. All right. Now verse 16, but if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. And so this snow is the word church is here in the singular also, but this is referring to the local church. So he's saying if you're at a place and this is happening and a man does something out of the way, talk to the man first and with him. If you can't, if him don't agree or if him just not getting anywhere, take it between two or three of you and work it. If it still don't work out, go to the church. This is talking about the local church. So I want us to understand something, brethren, beloved. We have the church universal, which Jesus set up and purchased with his own blood. It covers every man everywhere. This is what was spoken of in St. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. But then we also have the local church which is what is being spoken of in St. Matthew chapter 18. So whether it is here in Jamaica or it is in the U.S., we have the local church. Do not believe that a local church, if them walking with God, is extracted and separate from the universal church. 
we all together make up the church universal, the church triumphant. But there is a local church, and we must understand that in the local church, we better be careful because this is the tabernacle that God is dwelling in now. Even though he dwells in us as individuals, he resides in the church in this 21st century and in this New Testament era. And when the rapture takes place, he is going to rapture his bride, which is the church. It is, yes, individuals that will go up, but he is going to, it is the church that he is coming for, his bride. So you have the universal church and you have the local church. And I want to make this point that we must take seriously when we talk about church, because we are at a location, take your local church seriously. It's not a plaything. It is a part of the body of Christ. This is where you are connected to God from. This is where we are connected to God from. And we must be very careful how we walk and how we conduct ourselves and how we strive and how we live it is very careful through your local church you can become involved in the work of the universal church right and that is a point that we must never lose there is a great secret to successful christian living brethren great secret the secret is total involvement in everything possible within the framework of the local assembly, your local church. That is where your connection to the church universal is made at your local assembly. How you treat with God in your local assembly, how you treat with the church in your local assembly, sorry, is how you treat with God. And if you take your ministry lightly, and if you take your Sunday school class lightly, and if you take whatever you are in the church in ministry to do for God lightly, believe me, saints, because somebody have to tell us, somebody have to tell you, and I am reinforcing it into my own mind, how we treat with our local assembly and our involvement in ministry in our local assembly is how we deal with with God because the assembly the church is the body of Christ and we are connected to the church universal through our local assembly so my charge to us is to get involved man, and do everything we can and exhaust every possible avenue of doing something for the Lord and working and cooperating and being involved so that we can be filled with victory and move from strength to strength. I know the time is upon us. I'm about to close. I'm about to close. But in closing, I want to make a very serious point. Because our, our undertaking the study of the church at this point is born out of the serious concern not just by me but certainly by me you know in my position as pastor and also just as a saint of God it is born out of that serious concern. That serious concern that some folks um, are of the view, of the impression, and it is a position that we shouldn't be in, but be probably because of what we have heard by probably unlearned teachers. But the concept that in the church, in this era, in this dispensation, 
in this church age, there is a sense of ease and not a sense of urgency as was the case in the Old Testament with the church that was in the wilderness. I submit to us, given all that I've said so far, that this is a, an incorrect notion. It is important, it is imperative that we treat with our salvation in the most serious of way that we can. In fact, the Bible pulling from a situation in the journeys of the church in the wilderness as they were going through the wilderness, Paul was talking to the Hebrew church. And in Hebrews chapter 4, he made a very powerful statement. It was strong. Maybe we should just bring it on the screen as I continue to talk. Hebrews chapter number 4 and verse 1. It is a powerful statement. And Paul reflected, as we read further down, we will see. But Paul was reflecting on the journeys of the children of Israel. After they left Egypt and they were on their way to the promised land, he was reflecting on their journey. And he recognized, because it was clear in the scriptures, the things that were there. He said some things. And let us look at what Paul said in, in, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. He said, let us therefore... And it is very significant, that word, therefore, because it, it means he's following up on something that was said before. And if we go to the chapter before, in chapter 3, we would see what he was saying before, and I'll just tell us about that. But chapter 3 was telling us what was happening before. And that is what I was just relating to when I said he was recounting their experience. And they went through that entire wilderness experience. And you know what God did after a while? God literally through those 40 years now started to wait for them to die out. Why would God do that? We need to understand. We need to see something because, and this is very significant. This is very important. But let us quickly read again. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. The therefore is just linking it to something that had just passed. And in chapter 3, read it later on or tomorrow. But read it while everything is fresh in your mind. Very important. And as they went through, a couple of things. They didn't believe God. They were living in unbelief and troubled God. They murmured for everything. It troubled God. They complained about everything. Did you know that in the wilderness, God gave them what he knew was best for them? And he gave them manna. And they had manna every single day for the 40 years going through the wilderness. They were never hungry. But let me tell you what happened. After a while, the people started to complain. They started to murmur. They said, we're tired of this manna, this light food. And God took offense to it because God gave them the best. Now, what I have found out is that God always gives us what we need. And we always want something else. And because we want something else, we then start to murmur because what God has given us is not good enough. Let me tell you something. You see, when God sends to us what we need, 
and we murmur and complain and put that aside because we feel that something else should be there. God has a way when we constantly murmur and constantly complain and constantly, I want, I want, I want, oh God, and badger God. God has a way. Read it in Psalm 106. He has a way to say, all right, after I am leading you, after I am showing you, after I am giving you the best, you know that the Bible said the manna was angel's food. God take the best and give to them and then push it one side. Oh, that I could go back to Egypt and eat the fish and the garlic and the this. And they, for a plate of food, they would have gone back into bondage. And God had already freed them and is now giving them what they needed and what he knew was good for them. And they murmured. I'm telling us, saints, look what the Bible said. The Bible said that God ensure that that set never make it to the promised land. Yes, never make it to the promised land. Because God have a way to deal with complainers and murmurers and people who are ungrateful for what he has done. Yes, and people who live in unbelief. God has a way. And make no mistake about it. Paul in the New Testament, in the church, now wrote to the Hebrews and said, listen to me. Let us therefore fear, lest that promise, lest we miss the boat because of unbelief. Lest we come short of the requirements. Some other translation says, though, let us, let us fear and we not be found wanting. Or let us fear that we miss the mark. In other words, Paul was saying, listen to me. Brethren, look at what happened to the people back there in the wilderness. At the church in the wilderness, some of them never make it. Many of them never make it into the promised land. And he's saying, let us fear, lest we fall short, because we can. And when we look at the kind of admonition coming from the apostle, we must understand that this is not a free for all. We must understand that what we have is our most holy faith. We must understand that we must treat it with all sincerity and protect the spirit of God that resides in us. Yes, by reading the word and praying often and fasting and being vigilant about the things that we do and doing everything to maintain our separateness. In other words, our holiness that God said earlier on when we read 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 15. Going down. Be ye holy. So Paul warned and admonished the church to look back at the experience of those that were in the wilderness, the church in the wilderness, the tabernacle people in the wilderness. Look at what happened to them. And essentially, he said, take sleep and mark death. And brethren, beloved, I say that to us tonight in all honesty and sincerity. I will stop here, but I want us to jot down Jude. Jude, verse 5, jot it down, because you're going to read it tonight, or tomorrow, or during the course of the week. Jude, the book of Jude, verse 5, then verse 16, then verse 19, then verse 22, and then verse 23. I'm going to read it, because here, another apostle is warning us to take our salvation seriously. 
another apostle is exhorting us to hold closely, guard what we have. This is our most holy faith. It is not trivial. It is not light. It is no free for all. It is precious. And it means everything. It was in the mind of God from the moment he set that thing up back there. And it means everything to him. And it should be to us. Take it seriously. He, Paul spoke to the Galatians in chapter 5. And verse, verses 16 to 17. And verse 21. Write it down. Galatians chapter 5. 15 to 17, and also verse 21. And finally, the Apostle Paul also spoke to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, and verse 19. Brethren, beloved, I close tonight. Take seriously what you have. This church thing that we are in, is no joke thing. It is serious business. Be serious. Be vigilant. Be sober. Fight for this what you have. It is pure. It is precious. And the price, though free to us, the price was extremely high. God bless you as we finish. And next week, same time, God's willing, we meet for the continuation of Bible study. Let us bow our heads. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, great God. We thank you for this privilege. We thank you for this opportunity to have shared together one more time. I pray, mighty God, that you will minister to our hearts, that you will use these words and strengthen and help us to make adjustments as we must make adjustments so that our steps are ordered. Our steps are ordered according to your words. Help us to be serious and to be deliberate. Help us to be strong in our faith and to know that what we are in and what we are a part of is something most powerful, something that a great price was paid for. Help us to take it seriously. I bless your name. I put your people before you. Hold us in the hollows of your hands. Lead us in a plain path for your name's sake. We give you thanks. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. God bless you, brethren, beloved. Uh, just a quick reminder, and this is to all our ladies, this coming Saturday, uh, you cannot afford to miss it. There is a session that is going to be there for the youngsters, the young ladies, and it does not matter. From you are about 14, right up to about 20, little bit. There is going to be a session, and it might even be broken up, but I know there's a section for you youngsters. I don't want you to miss it. I want you to come out and to be a part of it. Amen. And, and that is going to be an awesome presentation with you youngsters. And do be a part of it. And then for those about 25 and over, there is going to be another sec se section in the session. It's broken out for you. And so you too are going to be thoroughly blessed with the presentations that are there, going to be, you know, given uh, this coming Saturday. I think it runs from about 9 until 2, and it is important that we are there. So every, along the spectrum where the ladies are concerned, from young as, young as 14 right up to 99, we have a place for you. And you have to be there this Saturday. Remember, lunch will be provided. And then now, Sunday, we are going to have the culmination of our women's conference. And it promises to be an awesome, awesome experience this Sunday morning coming. So we invite all of you ladies out to be there this Saturday. And then everybody to come out for this Sunday and let us have a grand time. And then the 2nd of August, I really want to keep throwing it in now. Everybody must be involved in ministry, and we are all called for this purpose. You have received the Holy Ghost so that you can be witnesses, all of us. So remember the 2nd of 
April. All of us, as church is through, we are going to put ourselves into some groups and we are going to be combing the community, evangelizing, giving out tracts, inviting people to church and doing the work of the ministry. Get your track shoes together, bear it in mind, and let us have a great time. And as I close now, I want to say happy Women's Day. I know today is International Women's Day. And to all our women, to all our ladies right across the spectrum, God bless you in our local assembly. Those who are watching from across the globe, wherever you are and you see this, receive uh, that from us tonight. Have a great rest of the day. And we love all of our ladies. And God bless you and keep doing the great and tremendous work that you're doing in the kingdom and outside of the kingdom. God bless you. Love you all. See you next week. Same time. God's willing. In Jesus' name. Praise God.